Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Maybe you can call your friends. Some room. <laughs> okay, so uh, I represent Delivery, which is uh, an eight-year-old startup based out of Gurgaon. Uh, not sure how many of you have heard about it. Uh, show of hands. Anyone who's heard about? Excellent. Okay, so Delivery was named the startup uh, startup of the year uh, in August. Uh, a few weeks back, we'll be getting the award in two weeks, I think. Uh, we are into logistics. We are India's largest, second largest uh, logistics company now. Our main business, bread and butter, comes from delivering e-commerce shipments from wherever you order from to your doorstep. For example, if you order a shipment from Amazon, about 25% of them are routed through us and go to your doorstep. Uh, we are also into a bunch of other B2B services, for example, distribution, uh, full, full truck load, warehousing, and, and the works. So we provide end-to-end -end logistic services for customers not only in India, but now also in other countries in South Asia. We have opened up an office in the US. We're expanding into markets in the Americas and Europe as well. Okay, so that's delivery. Uh, in terms of volume, we do about uh, half a million shipments a day. Uh, we are about to celebrate our 500 millionth shipment in two weeks. So that's going to be a milestone. Uh, the sales season is up, so uh, it's a good time. Uh, we, we are hitting around a million shipments a day these days. So our systems are put under pressure. I've been on the call since morning. Uh, that's a quick intro about delivery. Uh, I am uh, Kabir Rustogi. I lead the data sciences team there. I'll use this opportunity to tell you about what key problems we are working on. Uh, I'll also focus on some technical details about the problem on the board. Uh, but also we'll go through uh, why we're doing what we're doing, build some intuition as to what are the main challenges that we face as a logistics company and how machine learning helps us. Okay. So I'll start with uh, a brief introduction of our uh, network, our operations. So delivery is an operations company largely. Uh, what we do is simple. As soon as you place an order, we pick it up from the warehouse. Uh, it could be Amazon, Flipkart, Mintra, whoever you order from. Uh, we take it to our processing center where we sort it depending on where the shipment needs to go to. From there, it goes to a transportation hub, which could be an airport or a major truck hub that we operate. Uh, from there, it either sits on a truck or an aeroplane, goes to another hub, which is the destination hub. From there, it goes to some delivery center, which is equivalent of a local post office. From there, you have bikers who deliver to your doorstep. So this is uh, essentially what we do. Now, my, my PhD was in uh, optimization algorithms. So I did this, I finished my PhD back in 2013, uh, and I joined delivery in 16, uh, after a three-year stint as a professor uh, teaching optimization techniques and statistics. When I joined delivery, this was like Disneyland for me, right? This bunch of optimization problems, because we're dealing with uh, a huge network. Uh, our network consists of around 4,000 nodes, uh, hundreds and thousands of edges. Uh, at any given time, you have about 10,000 odd trucks running, 30,000 bikers. Uh, it's a massive network. So there's a, a lot of room for optimization here. Starting with network design problems, facility location problems, truck scheduling problems, uh, shipment allocation problem, vehicle routing problem, and the works. Uh, the problem is that none of these really work if you don't understand your ecosystem that you're operating in quite well. So all of these techniques, if you don't understand your ecosystem, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So you can do all sorts of optimization. I, I did my PhD in uh, machine scheduling, actually. Uh, I was very kicked about when I came to know these problems. I even have a big book on machine scheduling, which was part of my thesis. Springer offered to uh, publish it as a book. They were very kind, although the readers were not kind enough. The book sold only. <laughs> the book sold only a few hundred copies. Um, if it had a love story, probably even more. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, the next one would be a love story. Um, yes, so <clears throat> the royalties were slim. I thought it would make me rich, but no. Uh, anyways, so <clears throat> at delivery, I, I wanted to you know, solve these problems at scale. Uh, it was a very good opportunity for me. However, we got stuck here. So the ecosystem, it's very complex, as I said. <clears throat> uh, it starts with, we need location intelligence. If we are delivering uh, 600, 700,000 shipments a day, we are touching 700,000 addresses every day, which we need to physically find, deliver, and so on. So you need to have very strong location intelligence. You need to build customer intelligence, right? Customers are finicky. I, I, I'm not available on Sundays, I'm not available 9 o'clock. Nine I'm taking a shower, I don't have cash, come back in two hours, uh, <clears throat> which makes these things uh, very tough to do. Uh, we operate a fleet of 10,000 vehicles and 30,000 bikers. A lot of intelligence uh, goes in there as well to coordinate everything. Uh, we have 4,000 odd facilities. And finally, uh, on the order of a million shipments a day, so that is our entire ecosystem, along with a lot of other uncertain elements, which we need to deal with. Now, given these things together, once we have a very good understanding of these elements, then our optimization models can work, because then you know what you're dealing with. The hardest ones to, to actually build intelligence on, as it turned out, was location. Uh, in other countries, when I was doing consulting work as a professor in the UK, uh, that wasn't a problem at all. Uh, because location address data in the UK or most Western countries is very clean. It's very structured. Uh, postcodes in the UK give you the lat long of the address within 200 meters 90% of the times. Uh, in India, that's not the case. Addresses come in all shapes and forms. These are uh, pictures that we took on, on, on a trip to Old Delhi in Chandni Chowk. I'm not sure who, who has, who's from Delhi here. But Chandni Chowk is a very uh, congested neighborhood, very unstructured. It's, it's the oldest part of Delhi. Uh, so the first address I have is 1880-13-M-16. The one next doors call themselves as simply M15 without the, the other nice things. Uh, the ones next door was 1858-W-2. Now, with this sort of unstructuredness in addresses, it becomes very hard for us to understand what the customer really means. Uh, moreover, addresses in smaller towns are even fancier, right? People, people write addresses with uh, uh, names of their neighbors next to Gupta Ji's house, next, next to Dr. Sharma's house, next to the, the, the old mandir, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, you have workflows as well. I'll, I'll, I'll skip to an example. You have workflows like on the weekend, deliver to my house, on the weekday, deliver to my parents' house, uh, because that's where I spend my weekends. Uh, there's a very nice threat which we found in, in one of our shipments, right? This was, uh, I have masked the necessary details here because the man seems dangerous. Uh, but <laughs> what he says is house number XX, village XX. Post office, police station, district Jalandhar, rural Punjab, I want all products which I had already been ordered should be ori original, otherwise I take strict action against you because I am CID officer from Punjab. When I last time ordered, current watch the mirror and second arm, hand arm was broken. Adampur, Punjab, pin code. So the guy has been quite diligent writing everything, right? There's, there's pretty much everything we need. Pin code, city, brilliant address, but so many things that we don't need. So, <clears throat> oh, oh yeah, yeah, I can't make this up. I mean, it's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> okay. So the the good clients. I don't. I don't want to name the good clients, but you know the the good ones. They have a proper structure to type in the address. The smaller ones don't care, right? They 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 want you to order, you type in any crap and they'll give it to us and we are expected to deliver. So there are, there are others with, uh, with uh, nice words, with greetings to your family and so on. <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah, so addresses are painful. Now, pin codes in India don't work. 
the median size of a pin code in India is 90 square kilometers. Uh, as I said, in the UK, uh, average is around 200 meters. So pin codes hardly give you any ability to localize uh, an address. Moreover, 10% of the pin codes are wrong. Uh, people don't know their pin codes. Uh, pin codes are something which are passed on from generations. You know, your grandfather tells your father, your father tells you, and <laughs> there's, there's no way uh, to know what the pin code of your house is. I, I'm not sure. I've, I've been working in this area for a while. The post, code gives, uh, the post office gives some recommendation, but then they open a new post office as cities expand. And then there's, no, there's nothing in the news. Uh, you have to trust your father, really. Uh, <laughs> so, so we notice that 10 to 15% of the pin codes are wrong. Uh, also, addresses come with very nice spelling errors. Uh, one of my favorite ones is Andheri Oast, which is uh, one edit away from east and one edit from west. Uh, <laughs> and combine that with the wrong pin code, and there you go. So uh, that's why we have 30,000 bikers. I mean, <laughs> if this was cleaner, I, I'm sure we could do with less. Uh, also, people write besides very subjectively. It could be next to, one kilometer away, five kilometers away, wherever. Um, and of course, we've gone through this. So yeah, what is needed? So my job here is to make sense of this. So that once I know the address, once I know the lat long, then I can use all my nice optimization techniques to optimize my way there. Uh, but we got stuck in the very, very first chapter. So there are a few solutions out there which help us. Um, <clears throat> so in the news recently, the government of India has been trying many different ways to standardize addresses. Uh, there's plus codes from Google, there's robo codes from some consortium from MIT, uh, e-log from MapMind, yeah, what three words, zipper, all sorts. Uh, problem with these things is that <clears throat> they are hashes of a geocode. Geocode is a lat latitude and a longitude, right? So you must know your geocode and then it converts it into some hash, which is uh, an alphanumeric code. In what three words, it's, it's uh, memorable three words and so on. Uh, but at the end of the day, you must know your geocode to identify a hash. The problem is people don't know their geocodes. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, a lot of people don't know how to use maps. Uh, pinpoint your geocode on the map is very hard. My wife has three degrees. Uh, I asked her to do this, she could do it. Uh, <clears throat> We ran an experiment. Uh, uh, we asked about half a million people to do this over, over uh, a web uh, link that we sent them. The average error on pinpointing the geocode was around one kilometer, so, which is worse than uh, the noisy addresses that I have. Okay, so we decided to build a, a bearer system, uh, something which does not rely on geocode, so we decided to learn from whatever we have. Uh, so we built a system from scratch, which is able to disambiguate the addresses and predict the lat latitude, longitude, polygons, etc., of uh, of the address. Uh, that's uh, how it looks like. That's the front end of our service. So I typed in um, an address, a real address with uh, misspelling. Um, what our system is able to do is it's able to predict, okay, find out that it's Rahija Atlantis. Notice the spelling is incorrect at the top. It's able to find out that it's in sector 31, uh, which is a missing piece of information at the top. Uh, Gurgaon, Haryana, India. So it's able to predict the entire hierarchy of where this address is likely to be and predict a polygon of where Rahija Atlantis is. Uh, if you double click on sector 31, it gives you the polygon for sector 31 and uh, tells you where exactly that house is expected to be, which is the blue bubble there. Okay, so this is what we've built. Uh, I'll talk about how this helps us, how we went, on, uh, went about building this, and so on. Uh, but this exercise is very important because it helps us bring structure to the address. So you type in any crap at the top, it will disambiguate it and provide a structure. So if we get very, very good at this, then I do, really don't need the geocode from the people. I can get their address and I'm able to structurize it 
and give it back to them that, look, this is your actual address. Uh, perhaps you can use it the next time. OK, so speaking of polygons, uh, polygons are nothing but boundaries of the localities um, that we are operating in. Now, why it's very important for us to build polygons is, OK, for pin codes, it's, it's, uh, it's easier, right? Because pin codes are government-defined entities. However, localities are not. Localities, OK, a lot of cities in India are very old. People have colloquial names for writing localities, right? <clears throat> next to my neighborhood, there's a, uh, next to my locality, there's a neighborhood called Char Dukan, which was found, it was named because there were four shops back in the 60s, and people started calling the entire neighborhood Char Dukan. The government doesn't know that there's this, it's Char Dukan, right? And you won't find it any legal document, but the people write it very fondly. Uh, so we need to figure out what people are writing and where those entities are. So it gives a digital existence to localities and PIN codes often. Because PIN codes are changing, so even though the government prescribes them, you don't know much about them. Uh, once you know what exactly your locality is, where it is, how big it is, it, you can do analytics on top of it, right? This, this is a very good example. I'm not sure if the colors are, are very nicely visible here, but uh, the black polygon here is that of a pin code in Gurgaon. Uh, the smaller polygons that you see are that of localities. Okay. Uh, now these are the polygons that we have built ourselves. Uh, part of this team was uh, actually Vivek, uh, who was with us uh, uh, until last year. He's moved on to New Star now, but thanks Vivek for. <clears throat> I'll, I'll be quoting a bunch of your stuff here. Uh, so, so the green guys are the ones where we believe that are. Delivery time is somewhere between uh, zero to six minutes. The yellow guys are the ones where our delivery time is six minutes to 12 minutes. The red guys are the ones are where our delivery time is 12 minutes plus. So have, knowing these polygons is able, uh, we are able to do better analytics uh, on how our field executives are moving on the ground, uh, what are the speeds they are in when they're in this polygon versus when they're in that polygon. Uh, and this helps us uh, also determine the incentives that we want to give to our delivery boys and so on. Uh, so this is about, uh, uh, it, uh, the polygons help us track our field executives as well, right? Because if I expect a delivery in sector 31 and he's marking something in sector 44, I can easily geofence the location and figure out uh, what's, uh, what's wrong uh, if something is amiss and so on. Uh, and finally, once I exactly know where the place is, I can uh, go back to my optimization techniques and reduce the number of field executives I need from 40,000 to 20,000. And, and I pay my salary, that's. <clears throat> all right. So to build all of this, uh, the sources of data. <clears throat> so what we have is uh, a lot of address data. As I mentioned, we've delivered uh, close to 450 million shipments so far. So we have 450 million strings of addresses which people have written. Uh, along with that, we have uh, a lot of location data that we've captured from mobile devices of our uh, field executives. Um, so we have uh, around 450 million addresses. Along with that, around 250 million would have been tagged with an accurate geocode uh, when the delivery boy goes to deliver. Along with that, we have a lot of open source data from OpenStreetMaps and so on. So that's the data we are talking about. Uh, in our estimate, so far, I, uh, we have delivered to around 85 million unique households. Uh, the definition of unique uh, is, is fuzzy because uh, the same person may write this, the same address in 10 different ways, although we have an engine to uniquify them, but you know, it, it can't be 100% sure. So 85 million addresses is like the upper bound of uh, what we have. All right, so how do we do this? So that's the data. Now I'll talk about what we really do with that data. Uh, there are two broad steps to it. The first step is that I first want to understand uh, how our localities and cities in India are structured. Uh, what are the states in India? What are the cities in India? What are the localities in each cities, including the ones like Chardukan? Uh, so the first thing is we build a graph 
of all the localities. Uh, this is totally unsupervised. Uh, one way to do this is do this manually, uh, but that will take a lot of time, right? I mean, India is a very, very big country with so many cities. Uh, delivery is live in 2,000 plus cities. Each city on average has around 10,000 localities. Uh, so you can do the math. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to do, build this manually. So what we did was we started to build a, uh, build a graph, uh, which was trained on all the addresses that we see, uh, 400 million of them. Uh, and the graph looks like, this is a snippet of the graph, right? So India at the top, states, uh, I missed the city there, uh, but okay, the city is supposed to be Gurgaon. Uh, the locality is there, within the locality, sub-localities, within sub-localities, towers, and et cetera. Now, how this works is that given an address string, I, I, I tokenize each, each word, uh, I build n-grams from them, and I put it in, in a graph, basis how those uh, n-grams are related to each other in the address, right? So if I see sector 31 and Huda market in the same address, I am tempted to put them together and join them with an edge, right? If I see Rahija Atlantis and Tower A written very frequently together, I join them with an edge. So my graph essentially has three very important components. Uh, one is uh, we, for each node, we have the probability that this node actually exists. Uh, as I said, because it's unsupervised and people write all sorts of crap in the address, your, uh, your graph is expected to have all sorts of uh, noisy nodes. So there's one probability which tells you uh, what is the uh, probability of this uh, node to actually exist. The second one tells you um, the weight of this edge, uh, that the probability that Huda market is indeed a, a child of sector 31. And the third one tells you whether two nodes are actually similar or not, because sec 31 and sector 31 may be two nodes in my graph, but they're actually the same and uh, we must know that they're the same so that we can merge them later, right? So, although this deserves an entire presentation and a paper in itself on how we actually do this, but I'll, I'll quickly just give a very brief intuition and move on. Uh, so we learn these, uh, uh, these three uh, scores. Uh, basis, a lot of features that we develop for, for example, the features to know whether an address, whether a node is valid or not, could be <clears throat> simple things like the length of the, that address, the frequency, the number of times people have written that address, uh, the geocodes which are associated with that, the, the, the size of the polygon associated with that. So a bunch of features go into that. We have a lot of label data uh, that we have gotten labeled by some manual annotators. Uh, we can train our models using that and derive these probabilities using some machine learning model. Okay, so the second part. Now the first part only tells me what entities exist in India, but they don't tell me where they are. So now I'm talking about uh, what this uh, topic was ex uh, supposed to be. Uh, I want to now generate the polygons for each of those nodes in my graph, right? Which will tell me more about where they are, uh, how big they are, how small they are, what <coughs> are they geographically close to each other, and so on. So this is a high-level workflow. Uh, the, there are several pieces that go in. Uh, the first piece is obviously an input address comes in. We search the graph for that input address. Uh, that search looks something like this, right? So that's an input address. It searches the graph, gives you the list of nodes present uh, in, the, in the address. So this is a, a graph search that we do. Again, this, this deserves uh, an entire session to itself. But again, I'll skip uh, knowing that it does its job well. Um, once we know the node or the set of nodes present in the address, for example, in the, in the previous address, the set of nodes were uh, Raheja Atlantis, Sector 31, uh, Gurgaon, et cetera. Uh, so I know those set of nodes associated with the address. The second thing, uh, the third thing I do is I go and deliver to that address. Uh, the field executives goes and captures the lat long of that address when they use their app. The next thing I must do is validate whether the lat long is correct or not. 
because oftentimes uh, the lat long is not correct. The field executives, you know, they've had a long day. They, they want to take a break, smoke a cigarette. So when they're smoking a cigarette, they, you know, punch all of them together. Uh, <clears throat> they go back home, punch it together at home and so on. So there's some, again, there's some model which predicts, assigns a score to each of the entries made by the delivery executive. Again, it deserves an entire session to itself. Uh, but I'll move on. Uh, so the ones which we believe are clean, so around half of them, so we do, as I said, 500,000 deliveries a day. We accept around 3,000 data points from that, 300,000 data points from that. 40% we reject basis, some anomalies that we detect uh, in that data. So the ones which are clean, uh, so for a given node, we aggregate all the clean points and then you generate the polygon for that. So that's the main intuition. Is any questions here? I mean, this part is important, so we can pause to, yeah. Uh, no, it's not. It's actually not a very big graph, so uh, we don't really, it's less than a million, sorry? No, 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 we're, we're not, we tried using graphical databases where it's a standard PSQL and uh, we're trying to use uh, RDF and other things, but so far uh, PSQL works for us, but it gives us bad performance, uh, so we're, we're, we're working to do better there. Uh, so the, the time that it takes for us to search the graph is around 100 milliseconds right now. We believe if we do a better job at choosing the right database. Yeah, 100 milliseconds for a single core. Yeah. <clears throat> so the polygons would, um, what do you mean by fuzzy geocodes, sorry? Yeah. No, the ones we rejected, we have strong evidence to believe that they are nowhere close to uh, where they're supposed to be. So we reject them altogether. Uh, if we have very sparse data, if we end up rejecting everything, then of course uh, we run the model with a lower accuracy and you know, we use the points which have lesser, lesser accuracy. As I mentioned, we, we provide a probability to each point. So right now the threshold is at some, some level, but if we get very few points there, we can reduce the threshold. The quality of that polygon will be worse, but it's better than having nothing. So this spatial data is actually, with all of this, it's become very structured now, right? Because this is a latitude, longitude, some address string along with the node IDs that we've generated. So it's, we don't need to actually, we don't need to, no. You know, don't need to, but I, I, I'd like to hear more about um, what, what's, uh, uh, where your thought is coming from and we can discuss it offline, so. Not really, so. Sure, okay, so point and polygon sort of things. Yes, for, correct, yes. For that, yes, we, we do have uh, certain libraries which do it very fast. I, I don't recall which libraries we use, but someone, I'll, I'll figure that answer for you and let you know, so, yeah, I'll do that, so. That's the next part of the, that's, that's the last box, which is what the talk, talk is about, yeah. So after that, how do you define the boundaries of it, and if the node belongs to polygons, how do you, like, how do you know which node belongs to polygons? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, 
by the way, a node uh, should have its own unique polygon. Uh, but uh, yes, there could be overlapping polygons, if that's what you mean. So we'll get to that. Huh. So once we go and physically deliver, so we capture the geocode from the field executive, and this is just a manual data point that we capture, which is uh, used in all subsequent steps. All right. So now the final question on how do we create these polygons. So what we have is we have a certain node ID. Let's say that node ID is sector 31. And for sector 31, we have all clean data points that we believe uh, are taken uh, legitimately. And uh, now the job is to create some boundary for sector 31. But it's challenging, right? Uh, because uh, even though we do do some uh, pre-processing on the data sets, it could still be quite noisy. There are multiple reasons where it could be noisy. Uh, the field executive could have made a manual error, as I said, while smoking a cigarette, and we may not have caught it. The ones we catch, we are definitely sure that they are invalid, but a bunch of them we can't catch. Uh, when you go and deliver, do delivery in a building, there's bad GPS signal, although, you know, the, GP, uh, the guy has done a good job, but because it's turning to the closest cell tower and so on, you could get a very bad geocode. Uh, the other thing that would screw up is that my node identification could be wrong. So when I was calling AdFix, which is the graph search tool that we have, it's possible that uh, it screws up. It does screw up in three to four percent cases uh, that it could identify the wrong node. That happens Many times when people do write very bad addresses, right? They write their locality and they also write the locality next to theirs. Just, they're trying to be helpful, I mean. <laughs> but, but it doesn't really help. So, so they try and put as much information um, uh, which confuses our systems in about two to three percent cases. As a result, you see something like this. So the red ones are the ones uh, where we believe that the node ID is, let's say, sector 31. The green ones are the ones where the node ID is something else, sector 40, let's say. Uh, so you do see some, you know, crisscrossing here. So you see some red ones here. You see some green ones somewhere else. Okay, this is a bad example. Uh, but uh, the intuition here is that you have a mix of dots and crosses, and you want to draw a decision boundary to separate sector 30 and sector 40. A node is a locality or a city, uh, this stuff, right? So it, each of these are nodes. So it could also be the rooftop. For example, if someone has delivered to plot five in Huda market many times, we would have a node for that as well. But normally, door numbers are quite noisy. So people write door numbers in all shapes and forms. OK, so the intuition here is that we need to create some decision boundary uh, so that we are able to physically separate sector 30 and sector 40. I like this example a lot because in this case, decision boundaries are actual boundaries uh, on a map. So it's, it's very, um, you know, cool. Yes. So uh, the red polygon is after the decision boundary was created. So what we first have is just the red dots and the green dots. And then we created the, then we ran some ML algorithm, which some classifier, which, you know, divided the space into two. Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll come to this in a bit. It'll be covered. If not, we'll take it again. Okay, now let's formulate it as a, a machine learning problem. So what we have is our feature vector is the latitude and the longitude, and the label is the locality or the node ID which we predicted from our graph search. So to get the label, we have done a lot of work, basically. Right? To get this was easy, but to get the label, we had to build that entire graph, search it, and so on. Once we have this in this form, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, we should be able to apply any uh, nonlinear uh, classifier to build a nice decision, but to separate those two uh, uh, planes. Uh, here, the output that we're expecting could be two types uh, to answer your question. It could be overlapping locality polygons or non-overlapping. Uh, this becomes, uh, the overlapping bit are harder because again, in this case, it's not a, a clear separation between two. Uh, you could have labels which are, you could have the same feature vector with multiple labels, right? Which, which obviously makes things harder. Uh, for the sake of intuition, I'll stick to the non-overlapping polygons. To get a sense of non-overlapping polygons, think of pin codes. All pin codes are expected to be mutually exclusive. Okay, so what we do now is, uh, as showed in the earlier picture, we have uh, certain red points, certain <coughs> purple points. We try and create some decision boundary. Uh, in our case, we tried using a, a KNN, uh, decision trees, neural networks, something as simple as KNN works fine uh, with K is around somewhere close to 15. Uh, <clears throat> what we do is we divide the entire city into very small grids. Uh, the centroid of the grid, we find the closest K neighbors. Uh, the closest K neighbors are those points, the blue points and the red points. The nodes associated with the blue points are the majority of the nodes associated with the, the neighbors become the response, uh, the predicted label for my uh, grid. Now once I, I know the predicted label for each grid, all I need to do is merge all of them together and get a clean polygon. So this one is the polygon for the pin code 600006, which is somewhere in Bombay, I think. Sorry? Chennai, okay, sorry, Chennai. <clears throat> okay. Now, we do some post-processing. We run a concave hull library on the existing points so that we clean up all the empty points and we get a tighter polygon. Uh, just to give you a sense of how accurate these polygons are, I have draw, uh, drawn uh, the red one here is from Google Maps and the green one here is from authentic government sources, which we believe is the source of truth. Uh, at least for pin polygons, the government sources can be relied upon. Uh, in terms of precision recall, recall can be seen here as if you assume the green one to be the source of truth. Uh, recall can be seen as the fraction of the green polygon covered by the blue polygon, right? And precision is the fraction of the red dots uh, divided by uh, sorry, the, the, fra uh, the fraction of the blue dots divided by the red dots uh, and uh, the total dots within that. So the red dots compromise your precision basically. So less of the red dots in your polygon, uh, more will be the precision. <clears throat> okay, so these are improvements and that's the final polygon we get. Uh, I can do better at fine tuning. Uh, that's when the road networks come in. So locality polygons are, you know, naturally you would expect that a road divides a locality, a locality A from locality B. Uh, so instead of going for arbitrary grids like we did earlier, we can choose grids divided by road segments. So we, uh, we took OpenStreetMap's uh, entire road database. Um, Vivek did a lot of work here. Uh, and we got all possible grids that the road uh, the intersections uh, created. And again, you use a simple KNN sort of techniques. Uh, take the centroid of this grid, check the K nearest neighbors, and assign the label accordingly. This gives us a, a cleaner boundary, as, as seen here. So you see that it, it, it does follow the roads perfectly. You still see some jaggedness here. That is because of the noise. Uh, and we're trying to work on other techniques, maybe, uh, to reduce that noise. So this is uh, how to get better. Final slide here is a few observations and a few weaknesses of this. Uh, the first is that we need to look for a classifier which is uh, fairly nonlinear, right? So the more nonlinear, the better the curves of our polygon will be. You don't want very linear algorithms uh, or uh, even something like a decision tree doesn't work very well because it does have a linear separation between um, <coughs> 
Uh, for overlapping uh, uh, localities, this is quite painful because in overlapping localities, what you want to do is for a given dot, there could be two possible labels, right? A given dot could also be in sector 31 and also be in a sublocality within sector 31. Uh, to take this example, I may have a polygon for this hotel or uh, what's this called, brigade area, something like that, right? And it's, this location also lies in Rajaji Nagar. So the same X comma Y has two labels. So when I'm training uh, uh, the uh, classifier, the predicted uh, label, I'll take not just the top one, but the top two in this case. Yes. So now often, uh, because the earlier technique works only if all polygons are mutually exclusive, but that's not real life, right? You have hierarchical structures. So in that case, every point may have multiple labels, which means you may want to output multiple labels. Now, the problem with multiple labels is that if you take the top two labels coming out, uh, also a lot of noise may creep in. Uh, so again, it needs to have a lot of fine tuning when it comes to uh, these models, and we're working on this. Uh, so this one is an example of locality polygons, hence you see some noise there. Uh, localities by nature are not mutually exclusive. There's a lot of overlapping uh, or a lot of parent-child uh, relationships. Pin codes by nature are mutually exclusive. So we didn't face that much problem with pin codes, but for localities we do. Uh, finally, uh, the final caveat here is that all of these polygons are what people think their localities are. For example, when a person writes, I'm in uh, sector 31, we believe that he's in sector 31, right? I mean, uh, it's possible that these localities, uh, the polygons that we have may be smaller than actual government-defined uh, polygons because the, they belong to only our data set. What we see is only those areas where people are ordering from, where we're delivering to, and so on. So even if the government says the polygon for 60006 is 30 square kilometers, we may only have about 15 square kilometers of it, because that's where people live. All right, that's, that's it for me. Uh, you can have more information on our uh, tech blog. And for... <laughs> Thank you, any Thanks. questions? Uh, So we do build polygons for pretty much uh, every city we deliver to. However, for the purposes of a presentation, the cleanest ones we had for, were for bigger cities because we have cleaner data there. Uh, for our internal purposes, we don't need to put it on a slide. So we, we, they're jagged, they're bad looking, but they work. Uh, your second question was about blacklisted areas. What does that mean? So, I mean, uh, do you also create, uh, like, do you have some structure around that to predict those areas and like, of bad density? Yes, that goes into the uh, analytics part that I spoke earlier about, right? There could be areas where, uh, in general, customers are harder to deliver to, or there are too many returns, or there's simply too much violence or abuse, whatever. So I can classify. The, the harder part here is how do I identify which area is what. Once I do that, then I can do all sorts of analytics and uh, assign attributes to my localities, even addresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so that depends on the use case. So if I'm looking for something, okay, I want to see my returns over the last three months in this area, I fetch that data and, and, and build it. Thank you. Thanks,